nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The Corian is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. <laughs> Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week, our interview is an update on the lawsuit by the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan against Tokyo Electric Power Company for having exposed them to radiation during their humanitarian mission after the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. We talk for the second time with attorney Charles Bonner, one of the attorneys on the team representing the sailors who got hit with the Fukushima radiation. Our last interview with Charles on nuclear hot seat number 129 went viral. And this new one is just as explosive, so you're going to want to catch it. That interview, plus Numbnuts of the Week, and the Radcast Radiation Weather Report in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 11, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We start out with some of the worst of all possible news coming out of Japan that eight more Fukushima children have been confirmed as having thyroid gland cancer following the prefecture's checkups. This brings to 75 the number of children suspected of having thyroid gland cancer as of the end of last year, of whom 33 were confirmed as having the disease. Three months before, the number of confirmed patients stood at only 25, so there is an exponential increase in the number of cases being reported. The prefecture began checkups in 2011 because of the nuclear disaster at TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Those subject to the measurements were 18 years of age or younger at that time. However, a local panel of so-called experts said on Friday that there was no connection between TEPCO's triple meltdown calamity and this ever-growing cancer cluster in Fukushima prefecture. This panel, made up mainly of doctors and other medical experts who have obviously been co-opted by the TEPCO Abe Baby party line, said it is unlikely the disease was caused by exposure to radiation from radioactive materials from the stricken power plant. Gee, I wonder what else could account for such an intense and ever-growing cancer cluster among children in proximity to a nuclear power plant. Could it be swamp gas? Now, the total number of children eligible for these checkups is 375,000, but only 270,000 of them have been examined to date. So guys, you're down a quart, or a quarter of all children from Fukushima Prefecture who haven't even been tested and who may further impact not only the statistics, but your shoddy, despicable, false interpretation of the cause. According to Andrei Diomen, president of the Russian Association for Public Health, a surge of diseases five to six years after March 11, 2011, is to be expected in Japan. The rise of morbidity will continue as the general gene pool has been damaged. Next generations will carry the burden of that catastrophe. Russia went through the Chernobyl catastrophe, which was the world's worst nuclear accident until the triple meltdown at Fukushima, so they should know. TEPCO has finally admitted that there were mistakes in the radiation levels they recorded last year, which may be one of the great understatements of all time. A test well last July was wrong, and the actual level of radiation measured was nearly 170,000 times more than the permissible level. Now, TEPCO says this is due to improper measurement, 
So they have not yet revealed the results of 140 additional samples taken between June and November of last year, fearing similar underestimates, meaning the numbers are probably sky high. The company said that, quote, malfunctions of analytical equipment, end quote, caused these errors. Right, like a good workman always blames his tools. Even Prime Minister Shinzo Abebe's lapdog of a broadcast network, NHK, stated in their documentary, Radioactive Water, Fukushima Daiichi's Hidden Crisis, that more than two and a half years after the meltdowns, investigators have finally captured evidence of leaks from Reactor 1 containment vessel. The leaks may not be limited to the two locations found. Hiroshi Miyano, a nuclear plant expert, said, under normal conditions, water would never be flowing out so vigorously. There must be an opening somewhere. The containment vessel itself must be compromised. But it's very challenging. Locating the leak will depend on whether a robot can be developed. Shunsuki Uchida, a nuclear fuel expert, said, given the amount released to date, tritium will be emitted for 20 years at least. Cesium will continue for even longer, another 40 or 50 years. NHK said that crisis managers are still in the dark about the situation at reactors 2 and 3. As for reactor 1, they said that the current information suggests the radioactive water is leaking from places missed by TEFCO and draining into the sea. To which a TEFCO spokesmodel replied, It's quite difficult to stop the tainted water immediately. We'll have to deal with it in the long term. TEPCO initially built the underground dam along the shoreline, but it did not solve the problem. Radiation levels inside the port show no signs of receding. To which that same spokesmodel for TEPCO said, The flow of contaminated water into the ocean is causing problems. There are many challenges. To which Nuclear Hot Seat replies, You think? Obviously not. A different TEPCO spokesmodel said, There's no single solution that can stop the leaks right away. If necessary, we'll take some steps to improve the soil and ground conditions too. For the moment, we'll just have to dig more holes and check. Even Industry Shill World Nuclear Association admitted that computer models predict that all 77 tons of fuel from Unit 1 melted and passed from the reactor vessel into the dry well area immediately below. Each vessel has up to 200 penetrations. I guess that means regular openings in it. There's no explanation of that here. TEPCO has not yet been able to find the points from which the water injected to cool the core escapes. And IRSN, another nuclear organization in France, said, the entire mass of corium dropped to the bottom of the reactor containment vessel and came into contact with the concrete of the foundation base mat, initiating a corium-concrete interaction, otherwise known as a meltdown or, if it gets all the way, a melt-through. Thus far, the corium has eaten away a 70-centimeter deep hole into the base mat. But TEPCO states that would have to melt through more than one more meter of concrete before reaching the metal wall of the containment vessel. Oh, that makes me feel so much better. But there's no way to stop the damn stuff. And who's to say that the melt through of the containment vessel is not going to still happen if it hasn't already? Leave it to Dr. Helen Caldicott to put the whole thing into clarity and perspective. During an interview with CBS News from March 16th of 2012, she said, Units 1, 2, and 3 turned into molten lava, melted onto the containment floor made of steel and concrete, and it is not known, but there's quite a strong possibility that one, two, or three of them could have melted their way right into the earth. Now there's molten cores, three of them, extremely radioactive, which are being bathed by the water coming down from the mountains because the containment vessels are broken and the water pours in and or one or two or more of the cores are in the earth being bathed by the water. And that water is incredibly radioactive. Every day since March 11, 2011, 
300 to 400 tons of radioactive water have been pouring out into the Pacific. As to the government's proposal that it's time to start moving people back into Fukushima Prefecture, Professor Vavsolod Kartov, a prominent scientist and leader of the School of Solid State Radiation Physics for the Russian Academy of Natural Sciences, said, The results of the research carried out in Ukraine for 25 years after the Chernobyl disaster prove that living even in slightly contaminated areas for long periods of time is more harmful than receiving a one-time large radiation dose. Living on territories with even weak radioactivity for decades is extremely dangerous because internal radiation develops, immunity suffers, and genetic problems occur. I said that this does not comply with standards accepted in Russia and Europe. Even the distance of hundreds and thousands of kilometers from nuclear stations is no security guarantee. The Voice of Russia said, the area contaminated with radionuclides is about 14,000 square kilometers of Japan. That's the equivalent of 5,400 square miles, or about the same size as the state of Connecticut. So with all this bad radiation news coming out of Fukushima Daiichi, how is TEPCO suffering? Well, the announcement on February 1st in Asahi Shinbun is that TEPCO is going to post a profit of 189 billion yen, which is the equivalent of 1.84 billion American dollars for the first nine months of 2013. How did the company manage that? By rate hikes. They increased their revenue by 220 billion yen. The company also saved money by cutting repair expenses by 53 billion yen because they deferred work and they trimmed personnel costs by an additional 19 billion yen because they curbed new hiring. They've got that wreck up in Fukushima Prefecture, and they've got all this money coming in, but they're cutting repair expenses and curbing new hiring? To say nothing of the families that have been forced out and the mothers and the children that can't get away from that radiation dump? This is beyond numbness. This is true psychotic insanity. In my humble opinion, it's not an official diagnosis. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, numb nuts out of week. It seems to all be numb nuts this week, but here are two stories I just couldn't choose between. Under pressure from the world to take information about cleaning up Fukushima Daiichi from other than Japanese authorities, Japan created the International Research Institute for Nuclear Decommissioning to bring the best of global nuclear industry practice to the problem. Between December of last year and January of this year, the world's nuclear cleanup specialists submitted some 200 ideas. The group will now use a special team as well as outside experts to analyze and sort the submissions by the end of March. Some will be selected and taken forward as the basis for conceptual studies and requests for proposals. Planning the fuel removal and developing the tools to do it is expected to take until around 2020. Guys, what makes you think we have that much time? And what are we supposed to do in the meantime? hold our breath, and dress in lead-shielded clothing? Unbelievable. But wait, there's more. In an attempt to calm people down about their fears about radiation exposure, a Professor Narabayashia, who is a member of the Nuclear Safety Commission of Japan, said in an interview on Australian television, up to 32 grams of plutonium could be ingested with food without the danger of death. Mmm, snap, crackle, pop, delicious. He went on to say, if someone breathed plutonium, it was only deadly if you had 10 milligrams or more come into your lungs. This is completely contradicted by independent scientists who assume that even one one millionth of a gram of plutonium can trigger lung cancer. What are these liars doing gaining access to the public airwaves? And what are journalists doing 
about the fact that these people are getting away with putting their ridiculous information out there. Unbelievable and total. None that's out of wake. As for that election in Tokyo for their governor, which is the same as mayor, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe Baby's hand-picked boy, pro-nuclear misogynist Yoichi Masuzoe, won over the majority anti-nuclear stance of the people because the anti-nuclear vote was split between former Prime Minister Morihiro Hosokawa and the lawyer Kenji Utsunomiya. What a missed opportunity. And finally out of Japan, two quakes hit on February 8th. This was in Fukushima Prefecture and they measured a 5.0 and a 5.1. Ouch. Over to the United States where Hawaii, I'm so sorry, but the news is not good. An extensive plume of Fukushima radiation almost due north of Honolulu hit the island in May of 2013. Cesium-137 over 8 becquerels per cubic meter was found. According to Ken Usler of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, releases from Fukushima into the ocean continued over a longer period of time, creating an extensive plume of radiation that continued moving through the study site near Honolulu for over 15 months. A French government map shows the maximum radiation released from Fukushima directly over Hawaii on March 21st of 2011. These were the highest levels anywhere in the world, including Fukushima. At least Hawaii senators are on the move to introduce a bill that requires Fukushima radiation monitoring for at least the next five years. Testing already happens quarterly on Oahu, Kauai, and the Big Island. In submitting this bill, 25 written testimonies from Hawaiian citizens were submitted, and all 25 support the bill unconditionally. Mark Themans. Dean of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego, told of recent reports of local kayak operators picking up radioactive residue from Fukushima on the bottoms of their boats. Themen's research shows radioactivity in the air took about five days to cross the Pacific Ocean, but it takes about two to three years for water to cross the Pacific, meaning it's due any time now. Dean Themen said, I wouldn't go so wholesale as to say there's nothing else coming. Even if you're 99% sure, the safest thing is to just measure. An associate of his, Timothy Joe, a professor of geosciences and physics at the University of Arizona in Tucson said, what we've seen so far is a slow increase directly after the Fukushima accident. Now we're looking for a larger reading, which should happen soon. Oh joy. Bloomberg predicts that the runoff from the Japanese plant will mingle with radiation released by other atomic stations, such as the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant in Northern California. And in case you think you could avoid the danger by staying on the beach, William C. Burnett, director of Florida State University's Environmental Radioactivity Measurement Facility said, if there are soluble radionuclides in the water rushing up on the beach, some of that water could seep into the sand and into fresh groundwater supplies. Water left behind, as during high tide, would evaporate, leaving a residue of the radioactive material behind. As the Bonnie Raitt song says, ain't nowhere you can run, no, 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 ain't nowhere you can run. Here's a story that's way too local to me. As many as 10 teenagers have been diagnosed with brain tumors in the same Los Angeles suburb of Moore Park, which is only 45 miles from downtown Los Angeles. The parents have teamed up with Aaron Brockovich to try and find the cause and stop the spread of this cancer cluster. But here's the thing. Aaron, baby, I already sent you an email on this. The suburb of Moore Park is only 10 miles to the west of the Santa Susana Field Laboratories, the old rocket dying site, which in 1959 was the site of the worst radiation release from a nuclear accident in U.S. history. 13 fuel rods melted down, but there was no containment structure. 
just an industrial shell, and all the radiation was vented out directly. So the question becomes, did the kids hike in the local mountains? Did they rock climb? Did they breathe the dust? Was the dust blown over their land? That's where you need to focus your attention. Nuclear radiation, the gift that keeps on giving, whether we want it to or not. On Wednesday, February 5th, Emergency crews battled a fire in the federal government's underground nuclear waste repository in southeastern New Mexico. The Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIPP, near Carlsbad, New Mexico. All employees were evacuated, and at least six were taken to a hospital for potential smoke inhalation. The repository takes plutonium-contaminated waste, like clothing, tools, and other debris, from Los Alamos National Laboratory and Defense Projects in Idaho, Illinois, and South Carolina. We've been told that the fire came from a truck that was carrying salt. Okay, whatever you say. A little bit of good news here. Chicago-based Exelon Corporation told its stockholders on a conference call on February 6th that following its quarterly earnings results, it will shut down nuclear plants to save money if it doesn't see a path to steady profits this year. If you don't give me money, I'm going to go to my room and slam my door, and you'll never see me again, and won't you be sorry? Well, actually, no. Exelon owns 10 nuclear power plants, six of which are in Illinois. According to analysts, its Clinton and Quad Cities generating stations are among the potential closures. Woohoo! The company said it will continue to lobby for energy policies that would end the subsidization of renewables. That nasty hippie idea left over from the 1960s. Meanwhile, profit at the company rose 31% in the fourth quarter of 2013 to $495 million for a dividend of 58 cents per share. What in the world are they complaining about? Up to Canada, where Robin Brown, head of the Ocean Sciences Division of the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans, said that Health Canada was doing some testing on marine life. Canada had not been testing marine life for radiation since early 2012. Yet, Fukushima radiation was detected on British Columbia coastal waters in June of 2013. So the lack of testing, or the official lack of testing, seems, according to Coast Reporter magazine, profoundly negligent. Excellent use of words there. This article from February 7th said, Canada's government owes it to the citizens of this country to provide the most accurate data that's out there perform rigorous testing, and be transparent about the results. Every Canadian should back British Columbia's First Nations leaders on this one. Aho imase cho. And in India, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh said of his recent meetings with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe baby, quote, our negotiations towards an agreement for cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy have gained momentum in the last few months. Translation? It didn't go well at all. What's at stake is Japan's need to shill for nuclear technology and sell it to other countries while trying to indemnify its own manufacturers of nuclear technology, meaning GE, Hitachi, and Mitsubishi, and others, for liability in case of an accident. But to India a country that suffered through the disastrous gas leak at Bhopal and sued perpetrator industry Union Carbide over an estimated 8,000 deaths and over half a million injuries and won a $350 million settlement. It's not likely that India's prime minister is going to sign off on nuclear liability. Hopefully that standoff will cause a permanent break between the two countries and a move of India into renewables. We'll get to that interview with Charles Bonner on the USS Ronald Reagan sailors in just a moment. But first, I need to ask you a question. Do you like getting your weekly nuclear news update from Nuclear Hot Seat? 
Does it make you laugh? Do you find that you get value from the information, especially the interviews? What's it worth to you? Might it be equal to the cost of a latte from Starbucks? Even a download from iTunes? That's what I'm asking for this week for your support. Just once this week, skip your mochaccino, skip your updated piece of music, and send the money you save to Nuclear Hot Seat so that this work can keep growing and moving out into the world. For those of you who have tried to donate, my apologies. The donate button, the big red donate button wasn't working. Ha! The mysteries of technology. But that problem has been corrected. And yes, big red donate button on homepage actually does connect to the place where you can donate. So take a moment. Go to the homepage, nuclearhotseat.com, scroll down just a wee bit, click on that button, and send me the equivalent of a cup of coffee to support this podcast. And if that's too much, make it the same as a download from iTunes. But really, everything helps, and your energy keeps me in my energy and moves this podcast forward and out further into the world. My gratitude for whatever you can do. So last December 10, Nuclear Hot Seat number 129 featured an interview with Charles Bonner, an attorney for the sailors of the USS Ronald Reagan, in their case against Tokyo Electric Power Company for putting them in harm's way when they were first responders to the earthquake and tsunami on March 11, 2011. That interview went viral and blew the roof off the story in mainstream media around the world, at least as far as mainstream media was willing to go. Now, last Thursday, February 6th, the case was refiled in San Diego Federal Court. Nuclear Hot Seat caught up with Attorney Bonner the day after to get an update on the case. Charles Bonner, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. Good to be back. Thank you for uh, taking the time and revisiting this very important topic and this very important lawsuit. When we first spoke, it was back in December, and it was used on nuclear hot seat number 129. And at that point, you had filed suit in court in San Diego against TEPCO on behalf of, at that time, 29 of the sailors from the USS Ronald Reagan. Give us a review of what the circumstances were back then, and we'll take it into the present. Yes, when we initially filed, we filed on behalf of... Uh, I believe it was told uh, total of approximately 51 plaintiffs. Uh, the judge had a viewpoint that we were invading the territory of the president of the United States, the executive power, with the way in which we had structured the complaint, and that we were making the allegations that Tokyo Electric Power Company had essentially defrauded the United States government by concealing the levels of radiation. So we amended the lawsuit, and we now have increased the number of injured sailors from 51 to 81, and even though we thought the lawsuit last night, we received two additional names today. They continue to call. They continue to report tumors, cancers, leukemias, and various other radiation-related illnesses. The major difference between the first lawsuit and the second lawsuit is that the first lawsuit was what is called a mass action. We now have filed a class action. The difference between a mass action and a class action is that with the mass action, we assume on behalf of each plaintiff as an individual person, and only those people who are named in the complaint would be covered for claims. In contrast to the class action, the class action now will embrace claims for all 70,000 people who were exposed, 70,000 Americans, who were exposed to radiation through this Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. And that 70,000 includes 24,000 sailors, 5,500 of whom were on the USS Ronald Reagan, which was one of the first ships in the United States Navy 7th Fleet to respond to this disaster to provide humanitarian aid. According to an article in Stars and Stripes, the suit has expanded to include those who served aboard the USS Essex and the USS Germantown, as well as attached Marines. Are they now covered in this suit? All of the sailors in the 7th Fleet who responded are now covered in this class action. 
and that includes the entire 24,000 sailors, as well as other Americans who were involved in some kind of way in providing assistance to Japan, either sailors who were stationed there or soldiers who were there, as well as the various sailors who responded on the various ships, the USS Ronald Reagan, the U.S. George Washington, the U.S. Fitzgerald, and all the other ships that were involved in the Seventh Fleet, which is about 10 to 12 ships. So with this particular class action lawsuit, all of those individuals are included, and it includes now at least 81 named plaintiffs, that is, people who already signed up and who already whose names are included in the lawsuit. Can additional sailors sign on to this suit? Yes, and any sailor who is uh, experiencing any kind of illness or who has any fear that he or she may contract some illness in the future should contact us so that they can be signed on as a named plaintiff. It is very important that they contact us, even though we filed the lawsuit as a class action. The court still has to certify this case as a class action. If the court does not certify the class, then only those individuals who are named will be able to, to pursue claims. So we encourage everyone who feels that they have a claim, either based on an existing known injury, a sickness, or the fear contracting an illness. And I want to stress this latter part. The claim that we have made allows individuals to sue for the injury of a fear, of a worry, of an anxiety of contracting cancer or some form of radiation illness, such as leukemia, a thyroid problem, a thyroid cancer, in the future. So if sailor does not have presently an illness, if an illness has not manifested itself, but yet the sailor is worried as a fear that he or she may contract cancer in the future, they can sign on and become a plaintiff to be compensated for that fear under the laws of the state of California. What is the current circumstance with the filing? What is the process now within the courts as you move forward? Is this an acknowledged lawsuit at this time, or do you still have to wait for the court to get back to you? No lawsuit is a guarantee. Every lawsuit has to ultimately go through a process where the court has to agree to let the lawsuit proceed forward. Defendants in this case, TEPCO, they have a, a host of lawyers who will be making motions to dismiss the lawsuit. We will oppose those motions, and the judge will rule. But we are totally confident that we are going to win this lawsuit going forward. It's just a matter of time. So at this point, we have filed a lawsuit. TEPCO will have an opportunity to respond to the lawsuit. Meanwhile, we will be stressing to TEPCO and urging them to go to a settlement to set up some kind of a fund to take care of the medical needs of these sailors. The primary goal of this lawsuit is to create a fund for the medical treatment of these sailors. The question is, what is in the best interest of these American sailors, first responders, who went in to provide humanitarian aid? And what is in their best interest is to make sure that their health care is taken care of, to make sure that their children's health care and their offsprings are taken care of. And that's the purpose of this lawsuit. We will leave no stones unturned to accomplish that goal. You spoke of TEPCO, and I've had an opportunity to read the lawsuit, and there is an extensive section in there that gives the history of TEPCO's malfeasance in the nuclear industry that I quite frankly found shocking because a lot of it is information I've not encountered through Nuclear Hot Seat and the other research that I have done. Can you speak to that aspect of the case that you are building? Yes. Since the very construction of TEPCO back in the 60s, TEPCO was engaged in negligent conduct. It was negligently constructed, it was negligently designed, it's been negligently maintained since the exception, and all of that negligence has resulted in a host of various injuries and accidents. For example, back in 1981, 300 workers were exposed to excessive levels of radiation. And in December of 1995, there was a radiation exposure resulting from 
extensive damage to one of the reactors. In March of 1997, 37 workers were exposed to radiation. In 1999, there was a malfunction in, at the nuclear plant that resulted in uncontrolled radiation release resulting from an explosion in one of the reactors. Again in 1999, there was another radiation exposure. In 2000, there were cracks in the plants where the pipes were leaking radiated contaminated water. And so there's been a history each year, 2002, 2006, right on up to 2011 to this particular incident. So there's more than 10 incidents of negligent conduct resulting in radiation exposure and in, on some of those occasions, injuries to the workers at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. TEPCO has had problems of the problems. Meanwhile, they're making billions on selling electricity to Japan, you know, lot in the pockets of their shareholders. But at the same time, they are destroying the environment, they are killing their workers, and now they have harmed the U.S. sailors, these Good Samaritans that went in to help by concealing that at the time before these sailors went in, TEPCO was experiencing a triple meltdown. They had three reactors that were in active meltdown that occurred within five hours of the earthquake on March 11, 2011. And they concealed that information from the public. They concealed it from the United States Navy. They completely lied and allowed the Navy to believe that there was no radiation exposure that there was no release. Meanwhile, they were dumping 300 tons of radioactive contaminated water into the Pacific, uh, knowing that these sailors were jumping into the water, rescuing people. They, the ships were taken on the water, desalinated water, taking the salt out of them. Then sailors were bathing in the water, drinking the water, cooking with the water, brushing their teeth with the water. So they essentially exposed these sailors in three ways, one through the air, two through the water, by dumping this radioactive water into the Pacific, and three, the fact that the sailors used this water to cook their food with, they were also putting it directly into their bodies. Meanwhile, now, three years later, we have sailors again with leukemias, with thyroid cancers, with testicular cancers, women with all kinds of uterine problems, young 21, 22, 23-year-old kids with brain tumors, pilots who had perfect vision, flying planes now are blind from tumors on the brain. The cluster of injuries here are way beyond a mere coincidence and way beyond what you would see in a normal population of people. Say on one ship out of 5,500 sailors on the Reagan, you would not see such a cluster of these kinds of illnesses in this particular small population that we see. On the other hand, we do see this when it comes to uh, radiation exposure. We saw it at Chernobyl. We've seen it when there is a major exposure to radiation as what occurred here on March 11, 2011 with the Fukushima meltdown. As you're saying this, of course, I'm overwhelmed with such rage and having been at Three Mile Island myself, I know what I went through, and I, there's no, not even any proof that I had direct radiation exposure, but if nothing else, the fears and the pressure and the stress that resulted, the post-traumatic stress, was horrific. So anybody who went through this, whether they have a symptom or not, definitely is under stress, and stress is impacting their health. From what you're saying about this lawsuit, it's almost as if the nuclear industry and nuclear technology itself is going to be on trial. Have you had that sense of it from the work you've been doing? Absolutely. And we intend to put the nuclear industry on trial here because it is the misrepresentation from the nuclear industry that nuclear energy is safe that has allowed this particular incident to occur. There's this false sense of security that the for-profit energy companies, such as TEPCO, has created in the public. The public believes that, oh, these power plants are totally safe. In fact, TEPCO guaranteed the Japanese public that this particular power plant was safe. 
concealing the fact that, one, they built the, uh, the plant right on an earthquake fault, and that they had literally cut down a mountain, a uh, hill. It wasn't really a big mountain, but it was a significant elevation. They had cut it down so that they could build the plant right down at the water level, at the ocean level, right in the path of the tsunami. The true fact is that these power plants are not safe. You cannot God-proof these plants. You can't make a plant that will withstand the wrath of the environment when it comes to earthquake or tsunami. And because of that fact, these nuclear power plants threaten the world. The entire planet is threatened. Right now, as we speak, there is a radiated landmass the size of Texas floating in the Pacific. And it undoubtedly is going to hit the northern coast of California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, probably by the end of uh, this year, beginning of next year. This kind of contamination threatens the entire planet. And it has left an entire generation of young people now crippled genetically as well as mentally as well as physically. As you well know, radiation doesn't just affect the person. It causes genetic mutation, so it affects the offspring. It affects the children of an irradiated person. So uh, the, the harm and damage here to the human being is far-reaching, let alone considering the damage, the damage to the environment, which is ongoing. TEPCO is still releasing 300 tons of radiation-contaminated water. That's every day, that's what they release. Every day. And it's been going on every day, as stated in the lawsuit, since March 11, 2011, since the earthquake happened. This is a very serious problem. So, yes, this lawsuit indicts not only Tokyo Electric Power Company, but it indicts the entire nuclear industry. And it requires that citizens of the world demand that these power plants actually be shut down because it is impossible to make them completely safe. It's been clear that the most consistent media coverage you've gotten outside of the anti-nuclear movement has been coming from the military media, from the Navy Times, from Stars and Stripes, from publications like that. What, if any, support have you gotten from military organizations, support organizations such as veterans groups? To date, we have not received any support from veterans groups or from any military groups, except the uh, Stars and Strike military newspaper, which has been quite active in publishing stories about this lawsuit. We do plan to send this lawsuit to Congress. We're going to send it to members of the Senate. We're going to send it to uh, the Secretary of Defense, as well as the President of the United States. We are going to insist that our government first address these sailors' needs. We're going to insist that the government look and focus their attention on what is in the best interest of these sailors. Right now, the sailors cannot sue the military. They are prohibited by law from suing the military. And the military, the Navy, has started a registry to detail and record the various symptoms and illnesses of these sailors. But they discontinued that registry after about six to eight months. So now there's no there's no registry. So right now we need to push and we need the public to push the United States government to require uh, the veterans associations of the various hospitals to treat these sailors. They need treating and they need the United States Navy and the United States government to pay for this medical treatment. It's very, very expensive medical treatment. These are young people who cannot afford to pay for the kind of expensive medical treatment that they are going to need. So uh, we need the government to step in and provide that treatment. It's my understanding that Congress actually issued, it wasn't an order, but it was a strongly worded suggestion to the military that this be followed up on and that it is made certain that the sailors are getting the medical help that they need. And the response, this was something I covered on Nuclear Hot Seat in the last week, I believe, the response was that it was being taken very seriously by the military, by the VA. Are you familiar with that? I am very familiar with that, and we are extremely encouraged. That just happened a couple of weeks ago where Congress included it into the latest budget bill for there to be an investigation 
as to what happened to these uh, U.S. sailors first responders who uh, are now sick from this uh, Fukushima disaster. It is because of that interest that we are now going to send this lawsuit along with some declarations from our clients and medical records and encourage Congress to take action to treat these sailors through the VA or uh, through some kind of fund that they will establish, that Congress should establish for them to seek medical care through the private system. But uh, yes, Congress is now finally on board in expressing an interest in this case. What can those of us who are on the outside of the military do to support the work that you're doing and support these sailors who so desperately need every bit of help they can get? We need the public to contact members of Congress, contact their local elective representatives, contact President Obama, and also send letters to anyone in government and explain that these young sailors, these first responders, need medical help. They need their medical bills paid. They need medical monitoring for the rest of their lives. Their children health must be monitored. And this has to be an ongoing treatment modality, as I mentioned, because of the genetic mutations that we talked about earlier. So the sailors at risk, their children at risk, and these health problems will last for 50 to 100 years. These radioactive particles stay alive and they remain in your body until they cause some kind of mutation of the genes and create cancer. So people very simply can contact their government representatives, starting with the local government and moving all the way up to the President of the United States. And that's what we need them to do. Well, Nuclear Hot Seat will certainly be supporting that. We will be sending our own letters off and encouraging those of our listeners who are here in the United States. It's an international program, but for those of us here in the United States, to write the letter to your senators, your representatives, deal with whoever you can get to in Congress. And if you are a veteran, go through your veterans organization and let them know that this is something that is affecting the veterans from what is called Operation Tomodachi, which means friend, and that was the code name for it. And get these sailors the support that they need for the rest of their lives and their children's lives as well. Absolutely. It's quite ironic that the word Amadachi means help our friends. Now, these particular sailors, these first responders, these good Samaritans who went in to help Japan as our friends, they now need Japan's help. Japan needs to help their friends, help these sailors by, number one, admit that they have responsibility for the exposure of these sailors, and two, to set up a fund to take care of the medical needs of these sailors, and number three, stop opposing this lawsuit, which is seeking medical help for these first responders. Well, I wouldn't hold my breath for that last one to come through because they're really fighting on behalf of a very nuclear-minded industry, company, and even Prime Minister of Japan right now. So it sounds like you've got a battle on your hands, but I'm willing to put my money on you and the sailors because the cause is just, the cause is true. They have been harmed. They need to be recognized, acknowledged, and supported into the future for as long as it takes. Absolutely. That is our goal. What is in the best interest of these sailors is our mission. That is what we will accomplish, and we need your help, and we really appreciate you, uh, Libby, for all that you do. And we need the help of the American public and the help of the people in the world to make sure that these sailors are taken care of, first and foremost, and to make sure that this does not happen again. We cannot afford to have another disaster like the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown that occurred on March 11, 2011. We can't afford that to happen ever again in this planet. From your mouth to somebody in power's ears. Okay. Okay. Charles Bonner, thank you so much for again being our guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you very much, Lillian. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Please keep it going. Don't worry. I won't be stopping anytime soon. Attorney Charles Bonner, representing the USS Ronald Reagan sailors and other military personnel in a class action lawsuit against Tokyo Electric Power Company. We'll stay in touch with Charles and keep you updated on any further developments in this story.
This is my John Stewart call out and it is simple. John, you need a nuclear pundit providing material for your show and I am your girl. I'm putting it out into the universe. It's the law of attraction. Ask and ye shall receive. So I'm asking. Any of you can help us get together? Please do so. Send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Now, here's the weekly radiation weather report with Radcast. This is Mimi German for Radcast.org, bringing you the Radcast report. Today is Tuesday, February 11, 2014, one month away from the third anniversary of the horrific events which took place in Japan at Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant. We've talked about clusters of radiation readings and locations a few weeks ago on Nuclear Hot Seat. Today I will explain how you can analyze the data points you see on our maps. On each point, we provide you with a set of statistics. We show the mean or the average value, how often the measurements or counts deviate from that mean, which gives you the standard deviation of the mean and the median, which is the midpoint between the lowest and highest value of the median. All of this will help you to understand the average you see and the high that you see. The median is the middle value of a set of data containing a number of values. Again, this can be thought of as the midpoint between the lowest and highest value. I'll give you an example soon. It's important to know this so that you don't freak out when you see a number like 102 counts per minute as a high when the average or the mean is only 32 counts per minute. Yes, the 102 is radiation, but it is not lasting. You must look at the perspective once again, and I've talked about perspective here before. Without perspective, you have nothing but a stray thought that will inevitably cause you mental fatigue. The standard deviation gives an idea of how close the entire set of data is to the average value. Data sets with a small standard deviation have tightly grouped precise data, and that's what you see on our maps. And what about variance? You'll see this term on the data points. Variance measures how far a set of numbers is spread out. In one of our maps on a site in Minnesota, we see that the average or mean is 67. The highest spike was 93. The variance is 84 and the median is 67. Again, that median is the average of 67. The standard deviation is nine from the median. What that means is if you go nine up from 67 or nine back from 67, that's where you hang out. That's where those numbers were. If you were watching the Geiger counter present that final average of 67. Now your homework assignment, and you know I like to give homework assignments if you watch Radcast, is to go through the maps and get to know how to read the statistics so that you understand more about radiation and what we are saying, and then you can bring that to your neighbors. As far as the maps go, we're not seeing too much going on across the states due to fallout right now. We had a bit of fallout in Portland in the beginning of this unusual snow dump that we had last week. I took the counts on that. The radiation was mostly radon, but the counts per minute were at 143 for a while and gradually went down to the low 40s. I did a series of tests on the same snow patch. I brought it in the house, and I started at 143 and eventually went down after consecutive tests to in the low 40s. The average, or mean, on that day went up from 31 or 32, which is where I am most of the time, to 37, which was a considerable jump. We're going to keep you posted with updates on the Radcast Report daily on radcast.org. And remember, this is Mimi German from radcast.org. Thank you for tuning in to the nuclear hot seat. Thank you, Mimi. Here's an activist shout out. There's going to be a seminar on Three Mile Island held on the 35th anniversary of the crisis, March 28th and 29th on the Penn State University campus in Harrisburg. Arne Gunderson will give a keynote address on Thursday evening, March 28th. And for the conference, several portions of the Penn State University faculty will join forces with external experts to address the historic Three Mile Island accident and the complexities of catastrophic events in the nuclear sector and beyond. They'll also address lessons that were learned, probably lessons that weren't learned, 
and what the perspectives are in this era of homeland security. I will post a link, and here's a thought. If anyone has airline miles that they would like to donate to fly me out and back, please send me an email and let's see if we can work this out. I would love to attend. I haven't been back since the event, and I think it would be nice for some closure, as well as a kick-ass nuclear hot seat. Another activist shout out to Joni Ray for her help in getting this program posted to YouTube. However, there are obviously some technical glitches we didn't anticipate in this tech changeover to YouTube, and they all impact the sound quality. So for now, we're going back to the regular posting for both download and playing on the NuclearHotSeat.com slash blog page. And in addition, we're going to be including YouTube so we can start getting used to it and work those glitches out. Mark your calendars because my ebook is coming out on February 27th, my very personal nuclear reaction, one mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond. Just for fun, I'm asking everyone who hears this in time to buy the ebook on that first day. It will really help me in the Amazon rankings and make the book much more visible to people who wouldn't normally encounter it. You can buy it afterwards, of course, but if you can, Mark your calendars, buy it that day. Here's today's final thought. There are many ways to get information out about all things nuclear. Our activists have no lack of data, statistics, information, interpretation. We are lousy with information. What we're not so good at is communicating it to the public in a way that makes them want to hear more. It's scary stuff. And part of our challenge is to find the way to get the information out without scaring them. When Pete Seeger recently passed, one of the quotes circulating on Facebook from him really struck me. It said something like, sometimes the only thing necessary to change the world is the right song. So I'm looking for the right song or song to present to a world that might otherwise not listen to what we have to say. I'm also looking for sketches, good, funny, satiric, professionally written belly laugh material for what I hope will be a stage play, a satiric musical review, something that will entertain while we're dealing with all things nuclear. While I can't promise the stage performance, the best of the material will be shared here on Nuclear Hot Seat, with everyone getting credits and attendant links to all of the creators. If we can get our message into entertainment, we stand the best chance of converting those not already involved in our movement to pay attention, get involved, support the work, and help us where we need it the most. So if you have or wish to write a song, skit, scene, anything that you think is funny, sharp, and irresistible, send it to me in an email, info at nuclearhotseat.com. I'll collect the best and start sharing them on the show while compiling the material into a stage presentation. My one request is that you not send in any parodies of existing songs unless they are either in the public domain or you have written permission from the copyright holders to the use the music. Otherwise, we can get into big trouble. Gotta play it clean. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 11, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Japan Times, Fukushima Voice, Times of India, NHK, World Nuclear Association, IRSN France, CBS News, Voice of Russia, ABC Australia, World Nuclear News, Asahi Shimbun, NBC News, Kyoto News, Reuters, Bloomberg, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Hawaii Public TV, Channel 54, KITV, La Jolla Light, Science Magazine, DailyMail.co.uk, AP, Chicago Tribune, Coast Reporter, Dianuke.org, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weaver. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV. Our archive is available on iTunes or at NuclearHotSeat.com slash blog. All comments welcome as long as you keep them civil. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We're copyright 2014, Libiha Lady and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You can reuse this material as long as you provide my name and website for proper attribution. This is Libiha Lady and Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that we shut down San Onofre, and it's still shut down forever. 
And we've all had our nuclear wake-up calls, so don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.